paper we presented last year. The title was uh, 40 gigahertz PCB interconnect validation. Expectation versus reality. So basically what we wanted to do is often when you design boards, you, you, you design the board, you do the simulations, you manufacture a board, you measure it, and then your simulations don't match with your measurements. And then you start asking yourself, why doesn't it correlate? So in this paper, we, we looked on a, in a systematic way how, how to make these expectations match the reality. And uh, I used the process devised by Dr. Yuri Shlepnev that's called the sink or swim approach. It's basically a systematic way that generates, in the end of this process, you get analysis to measurement correlation. And it's done in the minimal number of steps. But there are basically three steps that needs to be followed. First, you need to have a, identify the geometry adjustments because PCB boards are not built as they are designed. That was one of the things we found. There is a lack of material models, especially for, for uh, digital signals on a printed circuit boards. You are looking at the frequency content from DC up to 40, 50 gigahertz. So you need to have a broadband frequency dependent material models. And lastly, you need to have a EDA software that is validated to work, for, to work with PCB and packaging applications. So these three elements is what is needed to close the loop and, and, and close this gap between expectation versus reality. So the, the biggest challenges we, we, we saw here was actually, it's really difficult to predict how the board is gonna look after you manufacture it. For instance, the, the traces we put on, on the outer layers, they were way off. They were not what PCB manufacturer told us they're gonna be. Uh, trace shape is also, we lack information. What's it, what is the, the, the edge angle and so on. Solder mask, mask information, thickness of solder mask, uh, property solder mask, very difficult to, to, to get. And the uh, lack of surface roughness models. That that's was the biggest thing that we show that if you do analysis based upon pre-manufacturing assumptions, well, let's, for example, at 10, 10 gigahertz, there was 30% mismatch between simulation and measurement because of lack of uh, surface roughness models. Unfortunately, because the, the, that is probably done at, at the copper clad laminate vendors, those who, who make laminates. But the thing is, once you, you want to do your multi-layer PCB board, the PCB manufacturer applies treatment on the side of, of the copper trace that faces the prepreg. They put oxidation treatment, micro etching, and so on to, to have better adhesion to decrease the risk of delamination. And that impacts the, the, the roughness. So, so the roughness you get prior to manufacturing is not the, the actual roughness that is on the manufactured board. So, so you need to, to build validation board or, or test boards to help you to extract the, the material properties. And the simplest method that I know of is generalized model S parameters. That is the method that we have been using. You basically only need two transmission line segments of different lengths. They can be single ended or, or differential, doesn't matter. And uh, you assume that the lounge structures are pretty much identical. And based upon this, you can do the material extraction. There, there's a simple way to do it. That's described in our paper. And, and with this, you can identify copper resistivity because the resistivity of copper on PCB is not the same as, a, as you get from a physics handbooks. It's a, it's a, we found that in our case, the resistivity was 30% more. Than, than of the bulk anneal copper, because we have different, different gra grain, grain, and, and, and there are also other uh, pollutant metals inside it. There's uh, more information about that in Paul Hooray's book, Foundation of the Signal Integrity. It can be read more about that. We found that if, especially if you run transient simulations, you need to, to extrapolate your, your measurement down to DC. So, so you need to predict the proper DC point for your transient simulations. So yeah, I mean, for uh, signal integrity, both, both the low and high frequencies matter.
Other findings we found in our paper was also that uh, the VNAs we were using, they gave us wrong results at, at uh, really low frequencies. Yeah, because uh, the, the return loss wasn't behaving as expected. We expected to, to, to go asymptotically down with frequency. Well, it went down, but after 50 gigahertz, for, for some measurements, it went up. And it's, it turned out that, uh, well, that's a defect of, of calibration, these electronic calibration units that are supplied with, with, the, with the network analyzers. So it's, it just shows that it's really difficult to, to, to make accurate measurements from really low frequency up to really high frequency. Well, for simulation software, we, we did this project in using uh, Symbior. But uh, again, this, this approach of building validation board and, and uh, benchmarking your, your, your simulation software, also you can do this to pre-qualify your PCB manufacturer. This can, can be applied independently of, of which, which laminate you use or which software you use. This is a, this is a process, it's a methodology. How to design predictable interconnects. Because in the end, what we want, we want to predict the behavior of the structures that we put on actual boards. And uh, in this process, we discovered uh, one very important thing was uh, localization. The structures you, you design should be such, such structures that you can accurately simulate them. For instance, we, we had a via transition where, where in one case we had nearby return vias. In one in other case, we had a return via far away. Well, it turns out that you cannot predict the behavior of that via transition if you, if you don't localize it. So, so when you design your PCB, you have to think about that the structures you, you, you put on the board use a lot of switching vias. They say, well, it, it takes real estate, but if you want to be able to predict the behavior of your, of your uh, via transition, independently where you place on the board, if it's on the edge, on the center or so, you need to localize the structure. That was the one of one of the big things that, that was an uh, eye-opener for me. Kept it simple. Let's just, uh, what we can affect, because as a, as a hardware designer, you really don't have control of, 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 the, of the chips. I mean, you buy from a vendor, not either from the package. So basically, we just focused on the PCB, bare PCB, nothing, nothing else. And, and, and just that is challenging enough. That's really, really ambitious goal to, to get correlation up to 40 gigahertz and even beyond. It depends. I mean, uh, I think w what we should be concerned with is not to have a impedance control traces or, or loss control. It's hard to have a predictable because if you, if you can predict it, well, then you can account for it. So, I mean, when I worked as a, as a hardware designer, I mean, in some cases, we had trouble with the, with the really short links. People tend like, well, th th that the long traces we have much loss are troublesome. On the contrary, actually, too little loss can give you a headache. Actually, more headache than if you have more, <laughs> more loss or, or medium amount of loss. That has to do with it because then you get the multiple reflections in the channel, and those are really hard to equalize. So as long as you can predict it, that's, that's the key. Then you can, can account for it. Either you, you, you need to, to make the traces longer, or in that case, uh, if you cannot do that, maybe switch to, to a cheaper material, one that has more losses. ANSYS has, a, has a basically from transistor level up to the cables and connectors. It's, everything is covered. So yeah, that's a... That's a benefit with working with ANSYS because they have really um, huge pool of talented people and, and also experience in different domains, both in fluids, mechanical, thermal and elect electronics. Let's say, let's, let's begin with the signal integrity because signal integrity in nature is, we can say, one-dimensional. Power integrity is two-dimensional. So, uh, but it has different set of challenges. Uh, so for signal integrity, you, you need to really think about you have to know about the measurements. You have to know about the design. You have to know about the manufacturing. It depends on, on, on up to which frequency you, you, you intend to, to work with. But uh, I think that our paper is a good starting point. Actually, I think more companies should build these validation boards. They're rather simple to build. 
but you can gain so much information from them and they can be used for, for multiple purposes. Benchmarking the software, they can be used to qualify the PCB manufacturer. Let's say if you have one design that you do with the, with the vendor A and you transfer it to vendor B, how do you know that those results, that those bolts will be, will be identical or, or, or be, have, have a comparable behavior? Well, you don't send your production boards, then, then it's going to be, be really difficult. You can send these test boards, do, do, let the manufacturer boards measure it, and, and uh, see if, if there are any changes. Also, you need to, to cross-section the boards to get the geometry adjustments and so on. So you need to really have a, have a full control. I mean, a, a tight cooperation with the PCB manufacturer is a must. There cannot be any more, this is my part, then I put to the next person. No, you have to work in an ecosystem. Every, everything matters, especially if you, if you are shooting for 40 or 50 gigahertz. Everything matters. IPC has 20 different methods for obtaining DK and DF value. And depending which method you use, you get different result. So, plus many of these methods are, are disc discrete. You get behavior at, at, let's say, one gigahertz, five, 10. But you, you need a continuous frequency dependent model. So no, you cannot get this information from the vendors. Some, some vendors, for example, we, we found that for Panasonic laminate, it was pretty much close what we, what we found. Uh, it was pretty much close to the data sheet values. Not exactly the same, but rather close. But for the surface roughness, there's complete lack. There's no information. You just get R, RA and RZ value. And those are more related to, to, to mechanical properties of a laminate rather than the electrical properties. And, and uh, and also we have found uh, that, for example, having HVLP2 uh, copper foils, actually the, the impedance, once you TDR the traces, it goes up a bit compared to, to, to HVLP. So, so these smoother coppers seems to, to, to give higher impedance. And, and this, and this can, can be explained if, if you study this phenomenon using 3D uh, electromagnetic field solver. It has to do with, with the circulation of current. You, you get eddy currents, and this thing increases the, the inductance of the internal inductance of the trace, and that goes up a bit. There's a, there's a nice paper uh, from Yuri about this phenomenon, and where he explains the, the, the physical reasons for this. People are becoming now more aware that there's a lack of material models. Because you, even if you have a golden standard field solver, garbage in, garbage out, you have to feed the correct data to get the correct results. And uh, there is no, no, no standardized way of getting this data. There are techniques like generalized model S parameters that you can use, the very robust method, but no. And, and people are starting to realize this, that uh, if you want to have analysis to measurement correlation, you need to have proper data models. You need to have a proper information of, of the trace shape, solar mask, for the vias also to, to have a good control of the, of the drill hole diameter and so on. So much more cooperation is needed between the PCB manufacturers, designers, and even semiconductor vendors, I would say. It's a, it's a complete ecosystem because, because the margins has decreased. Previously, when you were running at the lower speeds, there were plenty of margin. Then it doesn't matter. Maybe you had good enough accuracy. But now, if you want to have a really top-notch accuracy, you, you, you need to have insight in, in, in all of these domains. Well, I mean, we, we are looking for, for a lower power consumption. So, so for example, uh, on, a, on a board, you don't put re-timer that might consume more power put it takes more real estate so so if you want to for example especially in the, in the industries where you deal with a with a chip to module then you need you really need to fulfill the spec and 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 uh, how far you can go well you need to, to be able to predict the behavior of, of, of your channel you cannot just just uh, say well I want impedance control traces and and uh, so and so loss and as I said especially if you have a short channel well, having too little loss can be problematic. Then you need to really optimize the VIA transitions and, and its continuities. I would say ANSYS 
meshes the geometry as they are, and they, 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 they use least amount of assumptions, at least from the tools that I have worked with. Least amount of assumptions, and they, they solve it using full wave 3D methods, finite element methods. So, so uh, that's, that's a strength. It's a very powerful tool. It, 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 it has been used for many, way, many years for antenna design, for microarray design, and, and especially if you want to go high in frequency for signal integrity. For the 30s, well, it, well, it depends. I mean, basically the only thing that, that, that you can control as a designer is, is the channel. So, so then, then and, and luckily many, many of, of uh, 30s today, they are auto-adaptive. So you just need, you need to, t to take care of the channel make the channel as clean as possible, and then hopefully if the algorithms are, are, are designed properly, it will auto-tune. Well, at DesignCon, I, I, I have been here, it's my third time, and I really like it. I think it's the it's best electronics conference in the world. You meet all of old friends, you, you, it's a really good place to, to network with people, to learn what other people are doing and sh share information, share, share knowledge. I think it's, it's, a, it's a really good, uh, really good uh, conference and, and, and yeah, it's, it has its special place in the industry.